Okay, my name is Stutch Joseph, and the first business name is Island Beat Beauty Supplies, and Island Beat Salon, second one, and now over by Stutch and David Restaurant. It's um, a lot of beauty supplies, like for hair products. At the salon, we do a lot of extensions and colors and braids and other stuff, relaxers and stuff like that. At the restaurant, we offer good time and good Caribbean dish. I'm Larissa Crawford. I carry Métis ancestry from Penetanguishene and Afro-Caribbean ancestry from uh, Jamaica. So my business is Future Ancestor Services and I founded it with the support and brilliance of Samantha Matters. And we are a professional services social enterprise. So speaking, training, research, consulting, community engagement, research and work. We come in and we deliver services that center climate justice and anti-racism while using decolonized and indigenized ways of doing business. My name is Dee and I'm the owner of Soil and Soul. We have all sorts of tropical indoor house plants. So anything from philodendrons to calytheas, monsteras, everything. We carry all sorts of uh, mainly tropical plants, but we get into cacti and stuff like that as well. Um, we do a bunch of other services as well, such as plant care, repotting, and also we uh, cater to corporate events and um, gift baskets and all sorts of things along those lines as well. So it's a pretty wide range of services that we offer as well. My name is Gerlene Joseph, and I would describe myself as a fun-loving mother of four who loves finances. The name of my company is The Dollar Detectives. So The Dollar Detectives offers, it's a youth development program, so we offer financial literacy groups, life skills groups, active community activities. So it's really a learn by doing model philosophy. So what we do is we help teach life skills um, with money context. My name is Benny J, uh, MC, momentum maker, brand builder, consultant, friend of the city. As to why I became uh, an entrepreneur was, I mean, I was doing graphic and web design. That naturally kind of spawned into creating 10 at 10, um, using the culture uh, platform for hip hop, R&B, and black artists in the city. Uh, because I myself am an artist, uh, used to be a rapper, rapper on hiatus, spoken word poet. So naturally I wanted to create a space where it felt like home for myself. My name is Ronnie Mpambwa. I'm uh, the owner uh, and operator for Mako Hospitality. Mako in my language means clout. So that actually came from my grandpa. That's my grandpa's last name. Uh, I'm in the nightlife business. My base, I guess, is hospitality and nightlife. My name is Wumi Ido, and I would describe myself as a multiple disciplinary artist. I'm an actor, a dancer, a performer, a choreographer, I'm a producer, and the director and founder of Wazo Africa Music and Dance Theatre Incorporated. We offer several different services such as um, dance performances, festivals, productions, um, dance workshops, workshops about Africa, just to give more information about the continent, as well as events and uh, programs. My name is Cheryl Fogo. I am a playwright, filmmaker, and author. I'm a descendant of the Black Migration of 1910. In uh, Calgary, or originally known as Mokinstis area, Black people were present here certainly as far back as the late 1800s. Black business in Calgary goes back a long way because Black people experienced discrimination in employment and housing in most areas of life. We had to find a way to survive and so often that was through entrepreneurship. So almost for as long as there have been black people in the area, there have been black businesses. In terms of Mokinstis specifically, we know that one black family that was living in Calgary in the late 1800s was the Lewis family. Daniel Lewis was, he was a highly skilled carpenter. There are a number of homes in Mount Royal where Daniel Lewis's carpentry was practiced, and my understanding is that there are still 
homes that have staircases that were built by him. In 1911, there were a lot of black people living in a specific apartment building on 4th Street Southwest. And they listed as their occupations a number of things, including dressmaker, musician, of course, artists, musicians are businesses. We are entrepreneurs, so those would have been some early businesses going back, way back to 1911. Um, in the 1920s, there was a woman named May Emery who had a shop on 9th Avenue Southeast in Calgary, a black woman. She ran a business there for many years. Into the 40s, the Darby brothers had a nightclub in the East Village. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, there were two famous chicken restaurants. So there was the Chicken Inn that was in the East Village as well, and the Chicken Fry, which was on 9th Avenue and 1st Street Southeast, very famous businesses. And then into the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there were just so many restaurants, little shops, hairdressers, barber shops that were run by black people, black owned businesses. There were so many, I couldn't even begin to list them off. So there's a very long history of black entrepreneurship and business in Calgary. One of the really wonderful changes I've seen in Calgary is the numbers of black people who live here from so many different communities around the world. Uh, but who come together to support each other and to be in community together. I find that really wonderful. I recently took my brother to see a dance show at The Grand, which was a black-owned and run dance company putting on the show. And he was just astonished by the audience and these young people just doing what they needed and wanted to do to make their way in life. It's... it's Life in Calgary for black young people now is so different from what it was when we were younger and the black population was smaller. And we had to um, go through some stuff that, that we see the fruits of now when we look around and see young black people making their way and doing whatever they please and whatever suits their skill set. So I've really enjoyed watching the black communities grow. I've also really taken advantage of the restaurant scenes and, um, you know, the film, the, the Calgary Black Film Festival is a fantastic opportunity. So it's, it's really great. The Dollar Detectives was started in big part because of my story, my immigration story from Haiti to Manitoba seeing my parents um, struggle, working really, really hard, 12 hours a day, not knowing the language, not knowing the financial landscape. Like we lived in a poverty cycle, right? And so it was that moment that I had the aha moment that if you have a good handle on your money, it gives you such confidence to tackle a lot of things in your life right and so I kept that at the forefront and I kept learning how to manage my money better and how to invest be better at a young age 19 years old and I with that came so much confidence like even the confidence to move from Manitoba to Calgary that took uh, the belief that I could if something happened I could take care of myself I could pay for rent in a new um, in a new province, not knowing anybody, right? So I'm African. I was born in Ghana, right? I'm raised in Canada. Coming out of school, creating graphics, doing websites for different organizations and festivals in the city. That's how I kind of got started. Tunitin started off as like a, like a group organization doing a, a project that we wanted to see happen in the city. It wasn't started off as a business. So naturally, as it's creating more opportunity, it starts evolving into a business because it now needs, you know, the business entity to go ahead and create opportunities for it. So 10 at 10 itself, uh, we leverage the whole business based off of sole proprietorship, but it actually functions as a not for profit and social enterprise. The sole proprietorship just says that you have a business and that you're running it and that you don't have a board or a big team or revenue 
to worry about, um, I guess, incurring damage or insurance issues. The social enterprise is actually just more so what your mandate is and how you go about operating everything. So everything we ever did, we created, we put right back into the community, into the efforts that we did, the programming that we created around artistry. Wezo Africa Music and Dance Incorporated is a social enterprise. Being in Nigeria for 10 years before moving here, I got to see the vibrancy of music, food, uh, language, and the importance of family. Wezo Africa uh, means welcome to the land of perfection. And the reason why we created that organization was to support the preservation of African culture through music, dance, theater, and storytelling. The goal that we had in mind when we started this organization 17 years ago is to create a space for more black um, artists to be able to thrive, um, whether that's performing, whether that is um, being in one of our productions, whether that is being developed and trained in the development program that we have, just an opportunity for them to continue to grow as artists. When I, you know, I'm from the Caribbean, right? You know, so um, that's why it's called Island Beat. So the island and the and the beat, right? The beat of the Caribbean. At 10 years old, I used to make chains and all kind of stuff, and you know, and sell them to tourists. And then I migrated to Canada, and I said, I want to be an entrepreneur. I don't want to work for no one. But I ended up working for some people for the first few years, right? Which you have to, right? Get some more experience get to know the place a little bit, and then I was on my own from ever since. Entrepreneurship was definitely something that I've always wanted to do, something that I've always had an interest in. It's definitely something that I feel like it's in my blood. My mission was definitely to have something that was physical, something brick and mortar. Like, I'm a little bit involved with crypto. I had some businesses that I was also running online, but you know, there's something nice about all the technology that we have right now, but also having something physical, uh, like a location, is, is, is definitely something that I wanted to attain. I was really young when I realized I wanted to do humanitarian work. I grew up in a trailer park. We were, we were for big poor. I've always benefited from the grace of volunteers and humanitarian work. When I was 16, 17, I started a library in Pandai District, Ghana. I had eight months to work four jobs <laughs> and to, to, to pay for my trip. And so that's when I, I really started to pursue international development studies and communication studies. When I came to incorporating future ancestor services and building a team and reaching out to people, this is where future ancestor services really started to take shape. When I was eight or nine, where to help my mom. So my mom used to send me and my sisters to the market to sell different things. So, you know, we can sell eggs or popsicles, that type of stuff at the market. From when I was very young, I was always the type of guy that um, loved to plan different family gatherings. Um, I loved the idea of being responsible and making sure everybody has a good time. When I got here, I seen that there was an opportunity for me to be able to make that into a career. Moving to Calgary and being closer to my family uh, was so important to me, that network of people who are close to me. And for other people, that might not be your family, but like just surrounding yourself with the people that you care about, the people that can support you, especially as a business owner, as a new business owner, where sick days and like um, vacation time isn't really built into your first one to two years of operating, at least. Um, it's really important to have people around you that can support you when that's needed. And so Calgary is that place for me. Right, sometimes people try to run, they have destination uh, fantasies and they think that if they go somewhere else that that's going to solve all the problems but then you go there and you start from square one anyways right so when I start from square one where you have a couple homies at and a couple of these things going on and, and see what you can build before it's time for you to go somewhere else if you if you hit your ceiling I'm invested in Calgary beyond my business and I think that to me is why I'm so passionate about doing my business in Calgary because I really do care about the city I do care about the communities that make this home. I think there's this perception of Calgary um, that uh, we are completely resistant to the kind of work that I do. And I've been um, 
I've been proven wrong in a lot of ways. I decided to settle in Calgary because I heard that Calgary was up and coming. If you wanted to lay your mark, if you wanted to try something different, Calgary was the place to be. Before I went back to Nigeria uh, for two years, came back to Calgary, and uh, before I didn't really see the value in Calgary. I'm like, oh, it's cold, winter, this and that. But when you're coming from somewhere that you know there's a lot of poverty you get to see things from a different perspective and when i came back i came back on a different vibe i was definitely looking at it like there's a lot of potential here and i'm not going to complain about the cold i'm not going to complain about this and that when i i come to realize that people are suffering in other parts of the world so i definitely see the value in calgary what made calgary attractive for for business and so on is because it's a better place to do business, especially as a minority. The people here, I can offer more for them. It's not a lot of competition, like say Toronto and stuff like that. So Calgary, I think I make it better in Calgary than if I was in like Toronto or something like that. Because there's a lot of competition down there, right? It's, it's Western Canada. You know, you can go and be uh, a, a small fish in a big pond or you can stay here and be a big fish in a small pond, right? If you go to another city, maybe there's already people and other things that are already in place and you're not able to leverage your relationships or leverage what you have going on here. So I said, why not Calgary? It is very welcoming. Calgary is very welcoming to new ideas and concepts and different ways of doing things, right? The, the innovation and the arts and um, everything that's going on in Calgary right now and how Calgary is developing and and so that's what I find, like the dollar to Texas, we do things differently. We don't teach money in the same way that we do, um, that others do, for example. And so um, Calgary has been very welcoming with new concepts, innovation, forward thinking ideas. So. Well, from a competition standpoint, you know, the things I create were never based on what other people are doing. True entrepreneurship is about solving a need. So it's about looking around and saying what is actually here what requires something, a solution, and then filling in that need. So on my creative agency side, there wasn't people here that were interested in young, youthful, modern, hip hop, urban culture graphics. So I was creating those graphics, posters, flyers, and websites. When it came to events, I was creating everything from spoken word poetry to rap shows, concerts, and community efforts towards an artist so that they had a space to actually feel seen and develop their craft build a fan base, do all the same things that everybody wants to see and understand. Like if I make music, I want to see a room full of people. If you get over that little mind fog of, oh, Calgary is this and that, you start to see the potential that the city has. And that's just why I feel so comfortable being able to grow with the city, because it's definitely growing. Calgary is just a wonderful city and it embraced our services. So this is a great place to start a business. Honestly, if somebody wanted to open a spot, any sort of brick and mortar store, I would say the first thing they really want to invest in is, as cliche as it sounds, is knowledge. Knowledge is power. And I feel like for a lot of people like us or immigrants that come to Canada, we don't get to, uh, we don't get to succeed as much because we just don't know some of the corners that we need to go through and some of these doors that we need to open. We just don't have those keys that come from knowledge. Is a business degree needed to run a business? Absolutely not. You can have a business degree and not know the first thing about how to make a sale, right? But sometimes that business degree actually informs you of all these steps. At the very beginning, I committed to every month going to a mini course, a workshop, a conference, an event. I was able to access different United Nations um, social entrepreneurship training programs. And sometimes I'd find these opportunities by just Googling the topic I'm interested in, program, Canada. For me, I was taught how to be street smart from when I was very young. And so that was very valuable for me. Um, that's how I learned business. Education comes in many forms. It's not just through a textbook, it's through your uncle, it's through that dude down the street. You know, it's from that ice cream salesman, it's from that FedEx driver, it's from the Uber driver, it's from anybody that's selling you anything. It's from that 
you know, vacuum salesman that used to come to your house and try to sell you the vacuum, right? Business really just comes down to like, I got something you need and you're gonna buy from me. Just from being on the street, uh, selling stuff on the street. My mom said me when I was still so young that I don't think I could have had it better than that. So there is importance in learning about business because you just can't wake up, go and apply for a loan and blow it. You don't know what you're using it for. You really want to understand how you're going to manage those funds and how you're going to disperse those funds. What are you going to put into marketing, inventory, um, you know, clientele acquisition, um, you know, if you're going to have employees and stuff like this. There's so many costs that come into play. Our productions, our festivals, events are mostly funded by grants. So when we get the grants, before we um, get the money, we have to send them a budget and the budget will have an allocation of different, um, I guess, line items for specific things that we're using for uh, the production, as an example. I ran lean, I ran lean with the company being financial, having a financial background. My initial investment into the company was around $10,000. We're a remote firm. So the overhead costs are very minimal. I spent about no more than five grand getting everything set up. This was all my personal money that I was investing in. Um, I did, I was able to pay myself back uh, in the second year, so I was able to get that money back. Well, I'm an independent uh, mother of two children, I have two daughters, so I was not really financial buoyant and I did not want to um, take any loans out. And at that time, grants were not um, available. We're a social enterprise and in a space for arts organization being non-for-profit and charitable status, we did not have that type of support, so it was all self-funded. Fortunately, Canada, or at least Alberta, they don't look at, you know, the, the efforts that you're doing unless you create a not-for-profit. And there's actually nothing wrong with that. The Calgary Stampede's a not-for-profit. When I opened up Island Beat first, I only opened it up with $4,500. That's all I had. And I ended up selling it for over three hundred something thousand dollars a few years later. Honestly, I started with zero dollars. When I came here, I was 17. I didn't have anything. You would be really surprised how much you can make happen with a small amount of money. I don't really come from a background where I could just, you know, go ask my parents for money or something like that. I did everything on my own. I think people need to understand that you don't need like a quarter million dollars to, to make something happen. If you're creative and you have um, and you have the work ethic behind it, you can make things happen. You just got to have a plan. If you have a good handle on your money, it gives you such confidence to tackle a lot of things in your life, right? More important than the money itself is the planning behind it because you can get a bunch of money today. But if you don't know how to manage it well, you live in that cycle. After your business is created, man, the next most important thing is marketing. I think a lot of people sometimes miss that opportunity and don't understand that we only buy things because we see them and we see other people have them and we see that other people want them. It doesn't matter if your business, you know, sells carrot cakes or it's the next most upcoming rapper in all of the world. You have to tell people about that. You have to find money, put that money behind there, and you have to market to where people already are looking. It's very interesting because our organization um, has a way of advertising for itself. A lot of people know me that I don't even know them through just um, word of mouth. I guess we generate customer referrals by allowing people to come to our show, love it, post about it, and say that was an amazing show that happened. Um, for me, one of the biggest things has always been relationships and word of mouth. Uh, I'm in the nightlife and hospitality industry, so anything that you can do to create a buzz, um, nothing beats word of mouth. One big thing that happened in 2020 before the pandemic happened was the Grand Theatre was the show, the space we used for our production. And that Grand Theatre had a history of racism. There was actually a black person that was kicked out of that space back in the 1914s when you, I think you wanted to watch Shakespeare or some type of play like that. And this is in Calgary. I came, bought his tickets. When they got to the box office, they saw that he was black and said, nobody wanted to sit beside you. So here's your refund and you can get out of here. So he went and did a lawsuit. That production in 2020, we were the only and first black-led organization that actually did anything there. 
So from that 1914, with that history of racism and not wanting that person to be in that space, to us having that space, booking that space, and it being filled 80% of black people was huge. So that type of referral, because people kept test, you know, texting, and did you see what happened today? This just production just happened in this space where it had you know, a, a known history of racism, and it blew up. And you know, the artist that was acting there also blew up because of the opportunity being put in that space. Many of us exist in like this cycle of just go, 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 productivity, productivity, productivity. And when I look to my ancestors, that's not how they existed pre-colonial contact. They didn't work the same way all year round. They existed with a relationship to nature where our work throughout a year was responsive to ways the natural world changed with us. And so when we think of, well, what can we learn from that and how can we apply that in the ways that we work today and support our clients in doing that as well? Um, we've discovered really taking a seasonal approach to understanding our work years. And so looking at, okay, what do our bodies need in summer, in winter, um, in spring, in fall, what do our bodies need? What do our demands look like from a work perspective in these months? And often our findings are, are along the lines of, well, in the summer and winter, we need to rest because spring and fall are so busy with our demand, but then our, also our bodies. When we bring all of that into consideration and make note of that and how it changes with, with the season, then we are um, subsequently empowered to plan our year according to our bodies in accordance to our needs for rest. It has been very satisfying to be able to set my own hours and my own deliverables and also having multiple people who want to volunteer to help us because they see the amount of work we're doing and the fact that they want to also be part of that um, newness in the organization. People are like, did you sleep? And they're like, have you been resting? I'm like, wow, like it's just, I, maybe I, I don't think I look tired, but they know that we're pumping out events almost every two months is another event. And they're like, how do you, well, as I'm planning one, one is being planned again. As that finishing one, one is continuing to be planned. So they don't know that that one that's being planned in 2023 or coming out 2023, it's been planned since 2020 and is slowly working towards it. So they just keep seeing different events, different festival, documentary, different productions, a workshop, and they don't know that it's, it was in the, in the works for a long time. You know, being black, I have black friends, I have black family, I have black people around me all the time. And uh, honestly, this path of um, entrepreneurship, especially in the black community, can sometimes be a little bit frightening because not all of us come from backgrounds where, um, you know, if we shake up or if we fail, will have that support behind us. Um, arts and culture is not something that we pursue because it's looked at something that would not make you money. And the support was not there, even though we were opening our arms to that support. Um, but there was a lot of amazing organizations that supported us from the onset. Um, CTV being one, since Edmonton, they've always been supportive and they're still supported till now. Um, but in terms of our community supporting us, that is not the case for a lot of reasons. Hard work is definitely one big thing that was instilled into me culturally. It's, it's difficult sometimes, especially a lot of us have a lot of pride, including myself sometimes too. So many of us have been denied our ancestral histories, have been denied access to our communities growing up. I definitely didn't have access to black mentors, not many black friends. Uh, black spaces, black culture, um, specifically Jamaican for me. I didn't have access to a lot of that. Um, but as I got older and I started reflecting more on like, what does it mean to be black? What does it mean to belong to these communities? What does it mean to be Jamaican? I recognize that even though I don't have access to my ancestral truths, like my particular lineage, I do have the agency and access to understanding our histories. And so often we're denied our full selves where our blackness is not seen as a qualification to come in and contribute differently. 
And that is to the detriment of the places denying us that qualification. I have value because I've lived through poverty. I have value because I am indigenous. I have value because I am black. I had a tough time breaking into the scene because I was new in Canada, obviously. And you know, if you're in Calgary 10, 11 years ago, it wasn't um, as easy as it is now, right? To be able to do the type of stuff that we're doing today. Especially being a young entrepreneur, being a black entrepreneur, people don't really understand the, the mindset that you have and they try to make assumptions based on what you look like and your age and stuff like that. So it's really about asserting yourself as a business owner. Back then, I actually got in trouble many times for playing Afrobeats in the club because the music was too black. But now, it's so different now, right? You can go on the radio in Calgary and you know, you're listening to Afrobeats with Selena Gomez. The type of support that's needed to support up and coming black businesses in Calgary is, you know, it has to start from within. It has to start from you being aware of those 20 black owned businesses and, you know, asking yourself, when was the last time I bought something from that business? If you can ask yourself, when was the last time you went to that black owned coffee shop and bought a coffee before you went to Starbucks, then that's where the problem starts. It doesn't start from like an overall thing. It's just unfortunately, man, like, We'll have these things happen all the time, that Caribbean spot, but then you, you might only go once a year. But so how can they possibly keep their doors open for, you know, you to come by once a year? Or think of how many times you go to the other spots, like you go to that pizza joint how many times because it's good pizza. That's true. But if you put some of those dollars towards that other business, a lot of these problems will start taking care of themselves, right? It really is about the community that exists here, finding out about them, talking to each other and being like, yeah, you know what? My homie brought me there two weeks ago. I'm trying to go back. Now maybe it's getting on blogs. Now maybe people are talking about it on TikTok. I think the biggest thing is, uh, at least for the black community, we need to find a way to come together. Seeking out these spaces, seeking out whether it's um, entrepreneur groups or like fellowship programs for black um, students or entrepreneurs. I think we need to find a hub that connects all the businesses together. And we need to have a lot more financial support, obviously, and understand that one person's success doesn't mean you're going to fail. I don't know why, but I've always felt like uh, in our community sometimes, people are, are constantly fighting to be better than the other guy, instead of just being better for yourself. And I think until we do that, we can't really grow any kind of business that we want to grow if we're not together. The support that's needed to promote up and coming businesses in Calgary is having the opportunity to have mentors. Mentors are key. Having a mentor to be able to show you the ropes, the ins and outs, the do's and don'ts because they've already went through it and they have a blueprint on what worked. Someone that looks like me when they explain to me wholeheartedly and they're professional at it, I take it seriously because I know that their intentions, they are like looking at me like their brother, you know what I mean? And uh, I think that's probably very important. And if there's somebody doing something that you kind of want to do, help them out. Not to be a snake, <laughs> but to be transparent and say, hey, I would like to do something like this in the future. Is there any way I can help out with you so I can kind of learn from you? Um, just want to be transparent because I'm trying to do this. Because anybody that actually cares about what it is they're doing wants to see more people be successful. As a black business, it's so important to give back to the community because they're the communities that are sustaining you. We are nothing without our, our community and that's the key. You want to also treat that community well. You want to be able to support them too um, by coming to their um, fashion shows or coming to their restaurants and eating there. Um, that's what is a give and take relationship. As you're supporting them, they will see the need to support you too. You need to understand that culturally it makes sense that people who are marginalized, people who come from some of those, the diaspora, Africa, the Caribbean, um, and that they have programs or places that support that culture. So whether it's food or education, language teaching, um, 
clothing. It could be a, a ton of things, even films and, and arts and dance from those regions that they want to see more of, right? So if you like what you see or you know that there's something that exists, you've got to support the people that are doing the stuff, that are taking the time, taking the hits, taking those bullets now. So when you're ready to do what you want to do to contribute to make the city better, some of those doors are already open for you. Failing is uh, something that is also, as a young entrepreneur, something that's in the back of your mind too. But it's also a motivating factor, you know, that helps you go harder. You have to have some humility behind yourself, you know, you have to not be afraid to fail because um, I find that a lot of young entrepreneurs are afraid to take those risks because they're afraid of failing, especially in the black community. You know, when you fail, it's... Um... The experience comes with time. You can't buy it. You have to go through it. For the most part, financially at least, I've had a lot more losses than I've had gains. Um, but the one thing that has stayed consistent is progress, right? We're continuing to progress uh, because the experience uh, that I got from some of the financial losses has brought me to this point where I'm at today. I'm, I'm determined. I'm the kind of person that don't like to fail. And I just love business so much. And I like to carry stuff that people want and people support me so well. And the more support I get, that's what helped me to, to keep going. I think the more failure I have, the better for me. The amount of times that I've failed, it equates to how much success I'm going to have. My motivation to keep going is hearing those stories, like hearing how they plan to use the information, seeing the confidence that they get when they leave our program is amazing. Yeah, it makes me want to keep doing what I'm doing, right? Discipline is, discipline is a big thing, but the one thing that gives people discipline or grounds people, it's their beliefs. I love to pray, so that always gives me so much strength all the time um, to keep going, to keep pushing. I daydream a lot, so I daydream about a lot of places where I could be and a lot of places where I could put my friends and family as well. Because, um, yeah, I just, I imagine a lot of these things and that's what really motivates me, what my life could be. and the life that I could give to my family, my parents. I wanna retire my parents. I wanna, you know, put my friends and family on. I wanna start more businesses because this is really just the beginning for me, honestly. And um, I just really wanna be able to um, put other people on uh, because I know what it feels like to be young and you're alone and there's not a lot of people around you doing the same things that you wanna do. And that's what motivates me, trying to make my, my daydreams a reality. If you start, don't stop, just keep going. Just keep going. Um, if anybody would have told me that I would be here today, 10, 11 years ago, I would have probably never believed them. I measure success in the amount of people who show up. It's not about the dollar amount, it's who you're impacting. So coming to a production and looking up and seeing all seats filled, I'm not looking at how much I'm making, I'm looking at how many people are gonna take the information that they're learning and share with their friends and their families and their coworkers. So that's how I measure success in the impact of the people who show up. And also, um, I guess the, the, the amount of information we're giving to them in a way that they're able to go and ponder and realize that you know they just learned something new. In terms of career, being recognized by the Prime Minister would probably be one of the biggest ones because a Prime Minister recognizing your production and talking about how important it is for contributions of blacks who are enslaved from Africa and brought over beautiful dances such as tap hip hop genres into this, this space of art and people don't know about that and our production does this annually to continue to showcase that beautiful production and allow more people to understand and educate them about the importance of African contributions to dance. Uh, the achievement I'm most proud, proud of is how I started and what I've been through and all the, you know, struggles and I just happy and that I hang in there and just keep on going, you know, because many times, you know, things been tough, right? Things it got tough, but I, as I, because I'm so determined, I keep on fighting and I, I'm really happy. 
I don't really, I don't really see achievements as something to be, it's just life. Like, I don't really see this as an achievement or that as an achievement. It's just like, you're just living life. For me personally, a lot of my friends would be like, you should celebrate this more or you should celebrate that more. I'm just like, yo, I'm just on my path. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. But if you're talking in the store, I would say hiring was one of my big goals. I really wanted to have an employee. That's when I was like, okay, I can not only support myself, my family, but somebody else's family too. I was like, okay, yeah, that's like, that was a big achievement for myself. And that's gonna continuously continue to like be my achievement, being able to grow and being able to support other people's family through something that I created from scratch is definitely a good feeling. What I enjoy the most about entrepreneurism um, is really charting your own path, right? And be able to make a difference. I'm actually excited to get up every morning to really figure out what kind of impact we're gonna have today. Uh, what I enjoy most is definitely the potential. Um, you really see it's, 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 a, it's a path where you put in effort and you see the results of your effort. You know what I mean? It's, it's not really like a job where regardless of what you do, you're still getting the same amount of money. You know what I'm saying? Um, as an entrepreneur, you lack, you're, you're going to see that, you know, you're going to see the results of you lacking in certain places. So as long as, you know, you put in a plan, like I said before, and you actually set to it, and uh, you're motivated to do what you want to do, you'll definitely see those results as well. So it works one of two ways. You either are motivated and you get things done and you see the results of that, or you lack and you're just lying to yourself and you're going to see those results as well, negatively or positively as well. So what I enjoy, what I enjoy the most about being an entrepreneur is um, being able to be creative um, and bring, being able to have the ability to bring things that uh, bring joy to people. Um, if you look at me, I'm in the fun business. This, this, that's the business that I'm in. I'm here to make sure people have fun. Everyone loves to have fun. Everyone loves to have a good time. And so for me, my motivation is to see people smile. Uh, and the more that I'm continuing to progress in the business, I'm able to be able to deliver that type of experience. I feel supported by the community and, uh, you know, in in general, you know, if you're talking about artists specifically, unfortunately, artists, you know, can really only support you as far as they can support you, right? You know, they're really focused on their careers as it's supposed to be. And that's a good thing because, you know, if we provide value to them, then it's a kind of a good litmus test. But at the same way, like, you can only do so much for people, for so many people. Um, I mean, if you look at anything that I do, my it almost feels like the places have always been there because of the support that I get. Um, and some of the stuff that I've done, it's, it hasn't done well, but uh, a lot of people kept supporting me that it took a long time for people to even see that this is actually not doing well because the support that I get is just always overwhelmingly high that it overshadows everything else. The business that we're in is the fun business, but really the fun is for the people, right? So if you don't have the people's support, you don't have the people backing you, then that's not good. I didn't feel supported by the community um, back then, but then as time goes by, it got better and better. So for sure, right now, I do. I get a lot of support from the community, a lot. I'm really grateful that things are changing around, um, that I'm now the Arts and Culture Director of the Calgary Black Chambers. They actually opened that position because of me and because of the fight I was pushing on. This is important. There's amazing artists out here that are also professionals, like Cheryl Fogo. Why aren't you bringing them in this space and allowing them to feel comfortable with professionals such as lawyers and doctors and um, accountants, etc. We're also professions. So they saw that op opportunity, they took it, and now we're bringing more artists into that space. There's still people who want to be within the entertainment industry or the music industry. Um, there's still people who just are enthusiasts of the music industry, arts and culture industry, that want to support people or support artists or support that industry at large. So creating a platform where they're able to kind of get their hands dirty, get involved and see more things is, is kind of 
you know, a good enough way where I know that, yeah, we're, we're super important for that reason. We don't really have many black actors, black playwrights, black dancers. So we created a development program called the Black Arts Development Program. It has a component of um, dance, visual arts, um, theater, film, um, music and media and also mentorship. So we've done the script writing and the actors development for theater and film in 2021 during the pandemic. 2022, we did a dance workshop that was three weeks and supported 58 um, black artists who needed to learn about specific dance styles. And then this year we're doing mentorship program. So the reason why we're doing this is because we saw a gap in the, um, in the, in the amount of artists in that space. And we wanted to be able to create more value for the community to have them trained and developed and allow them to continue to work in that space and have more opportunities. So once you look at your own organization and what you're putting out in your events and you're seeing that there's a gap there, try to fill that gap by utilizing your um, skill set and the, the community that you've already built to be able to bring them to par. I feel absolutely supported by my community. Like I mentioned, we do things a little bit differently, teaching financial literacy. Um, I, my black community has supported me. They're on my board. They're on, you know, they are working with me. And so um, Calgary as a whole community accepted us. Um, being new to the marketplace, uh, you know, a lot of people might have apprehensions. But yeah, I feel like my black community, Calgary as a whole community, has really taken to the dollar detectives. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. If you look at places like Toronto, uh, you're not even able to know like who's friends with who here or who's related to who because everybody's just so together. And I feel like in Calgary, it has been so separate for so long. And if I am in Calgary, uh, still in 10 years, that's probably my top goal is to continue to create environments that bring people together with good music, good food, good energy. You know, I just love to see a smile on people's face. And once you can, and you know, I also help a lot of the young kids growing up, coming up now and try to motivate them and try to let them know that if I can do it, you can do it too. And you know, and I know a few people that open up their own business um, that I help and uh, you know, and I, I'm happy when I see something like that. You know, one day I would like to retire and just pass a torch on someone else. It may be my kids, whoever, right? You know, stuff like that. There was nobody like us to imitate. There was no organization that I could go and ask questions about to clarify on how to create a production, how to direct a show, um, how to find funding. Funding was really difficult. So that was one of the issues, was just not having someone to be able to speak to, like a mentor. Um, that's why we developed the mentorship program, because that was another issue that I had when I started, and I want to make sure that we don't have the same issue going forward. Um, so that's another thing too, leadership. How do you become a leader uh, in the arts when you don't have anybody in that space to be able to ask questions for? So how, as I grew um, in the organization, and I grew in the space, I was the only black woman-led organization doing the arts, it was really unique. So I took advantage of that uniqueness and brought forth more, um, more opportunities for people who didn't have that to learn from me and grow in that space. We have such a diverse range of clients from uh, indigenous youth-led um, collectives and grassroots and or uh, activist organizations to nearly every federal ministry in Canada to major international law firms, the United Nations, different energy ministerials, energy companies. We're able to, for example, bring the small, the learnings that we, we gain from the small arts clients um, to policymakers in the arts and cultures. As far as ethnicity goes, um, being black, you know, a lot of people don't really expect you to be in certain industries, especially, you know, owning a plant store or doing some certain other things. Sometimes it's not really expected of you. You can definitely see people's faces like, huh, really? You do what? Oh, so it's definitely interesting to see that on a daily basis. And um, yeah, it's interesting to kind of cut 
uh, stereotypes about who we are and what we do and the things that we have the potential of doing. You know, being black doesn't limit us as far as the things that we're able to do, the things we're able to create and the things that we're be able to be involved in, you know? So yeah, you, you just gotta find ways to use everything to your advantage and turn disadvantages to advantages. So uh, when Ten to Ten started off, there was there was three of us. Next, that became four. Then it became five, and then it became next person wanted to help out, and the next person wanted to help out, and it grows from there depending on what you're doing and what your needs are. I have a lot of people that are in my team. Our team is constantly growing and growing and growing. Um, you know, just because the more things that you have, the more responsibilities that you have, right? And Calgary is constantly growing and uh, expanding. So, you know, a city that used to be for like a million people now, I mean, we're hundreds of thousands of people past that now. So you gotta have more people out there spreading the word about your spot. I think one of the hardest things to do when starting a business is determining who you wanna work with and finding that team, which is both exciting and very nerve wracking. As you're creating it all is based on that vision. As long as people can see the vision, or see how they fit into your vision, it becomes an easy enough thing. You know, to grow your team in any kind of business that you're building, it really just comes down to being dedicated to what it is that you're trying to create. I had that, I, like I had an idea of what I wanted to do, what kind of firm I wanted to, to be a part of. Um, I went through the incorporation process, but it was really when I brought on uh, a diverse group of people, particularly Samantha Matters, that we were really able to start to define what Future Ancestor Services really is. Connections, relationships are everything. And you're only as good as your team. You can't do it by yourself. And the more your team is diverse, um, the more your team is on the ball, the better for you, absolutely. I mean, if you're gonna be looking to build a business and you wanna go ahead and do it at the top level of what you need, or for what your vision is looking for, you never wanna cut corners. And what you wanna actually do is say, what are your strengths? Understand your weaknesses and then have people fill those weaknesses for you. I'm very money and financially adverse. And so bringing on someone who is so excited about money and talking about money in our financial systems, that was really, really important. There is a lot of fear around money and there is a lot of shame around money. There's a lot of money's not spoken about. So we put it out there in a fun way. So, you know, one of the things that I, uh, I'm still learning now is finding time to continue to be creative because that's what I'm good at. So I'm not gonna try to be a lawyer because I'm not. I'm not gonna try to be an accountant just because I'm not. Um, I'm not gonna try to be a chef because I'm, I'm just not a chef. And so I focus more on the things that I'm good at now. And I think the more you have so many things going on, the more you realize you need more help. You can do it by yourself. Modern entrepreneurship isn't about you doing every single role, right? Modern entrepreneurship was built around, you know, Henry Ford, who created a full conveyor belt system. You work on nuts, you work on bolts, you work on wheels, you work on this, you work on that, right? Now you're working on all those things and you're still getting a full car made. Whereas a Rolls Royce is as expensive as it is because one person is working on that one vehicle until it's finished. It's a way slower way to go ahead about creating something, right? So you want to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people that are specialists in those areas. If you can't hire them as staff full time, then sure, go ahead and outsource it. You know, whether it's a bookkeeper that you only need once every, you know, once a month or once every quarter or whatever like that. Go ahead and advert, hire an advertising firm or a graphic designer if you only, maybe you're only doing events once every three months, you only need one poster, then maybe it doesn't make sense for them to be on your staff, but you can hire that person out. It's hundred bucks to get a flyer and, and keep it moving, right? So you, you always wanna look at what your strengths are, what, your, what are your weaknesses and then get your weaknesses filled out. And there's tons of ways to do that. You can go to fiverr.com. You know, there's a lot of people on there who are willing to trade their services for money and not the highest rate. Sometimes it's just like a hundred bucks to do something that would maybe charge or cost a lot more if you were to hire a full agency for it and stuff. So.
And unfortunately, most businesses still take about the first two to three years to even see revenue because they've invested so much upfront or they invest so much along as they're going that maybe they don't see any benefit in those first few years. But that all being said, if you got a good bookkeeper or accountant, you can kind of stay ahead of those things or you can project really well and, and try to build your team when you're ready to. Our first year was pre-revenue. Of course, we took a loss like every business. Thanks to grants, thanks to the community supporting us, we are profitable now. Yeah, it took me around five, six months in to start seeing, you know, my return on my investment. And um, yeah, around the five, six month mark, I've been fortunate enough now to be able to hire some employees, which is something that I'm really grateful for. And um, yeah, around five, six months is how long it took for me to see that return on investment. At Future Ancestor Services, we use a subcontractor model. And so, None of our team are actual employees. They're subcontractors that work with us on a long-term basis. And so I set the commission at 10% at the very beginning because um, our overhead is very cheap. And I'm not in this to like be a millionaire. I'm not in this to make a lot of money. We've started turning a profit very, very quickly, like within the first six months, again, because of the demand early on with uh, when we launched. Uh, and then also that is a result of very little overhead. Also uh, the way we're able to price our services and uh, how quickly we're able to see that return um, after a service is delivered. How long it take me to earn a profit? About five years. Back then it was about five years because you know, when you start a business, it takes time before you can pay yourself. So and back then, when I opened up the store, there wasn't much Caribbean or African people around to support, right? So it was a little harder back then. Today now, it's much easier to open up a business because Calgary grown. You know, I'm still evolving what 10 to 10 currently is and what new entities are going to be following 10 to 10. You're, you're only expanding when you're able to pay all of your bills, pay your staff, and you have a little bit of money left over at the end of the year. If you have some money left over to go ahead and create some other thing, maybe hire a new staff member or, you know, launch a new idea or do something, then go ahead and do that. Well, I guess as time goes by, you start to deal with a lot of things that are outside of your scope. I want to take things to the next level. I'm thinking of doing it big enough so that if my friends are in town, you know, maybe Big Sean's in town or T.I. is in town or, you know, whatever celebrities in town that we're good friends with or we're connected to, they can easily come to my spot. So if whatever we're doing is not suitable to take it and put it in a bigger city, that means we're doing something wrong. What I hope to achieve in the next 10 years, I would like to have a franchise of Island Beat at least five more, five to six more stores. Not just in Calgary, even in Edmonton, in Alberta, you know, place, different places in Alberta, maybe BC. I want to achieve a lot of things in the next 10 years. My hope for the Dollar Detectives is we have different chapters, different branches across the city. Um, not only in Calgary, but in different locations, and hopefully expand out. Because like I mentioned, this, this is such a valuable life skill. Financial literacy is such a valuable life skill. So I would like to see branches across Canada of youth participating in our programs and attending camps and um, having fun with money. So that's my goal, my hope for the next 10 years. In the next 10 years, I want Future Ancestor Services to be completely operational without me. Um, I think that's really important um, to set up an organization where it's never completely dependent on one person. It was a goal of mine to, to make sure that whatever business I have becomes passive. So if I'm at home and I know that my business is running without me, that's why I never really made myself the face of the business. It's just soil and soul. And Audrey upstairs, that, that Venus flytrap is the, is the mascot, mascot, the face of the business. It's not me. So yeah, it's, it's, 
it's not really I feel pride of being able to um, uh, hire people. It's more that the business was able to hire people. I, I'm proud of the business, but not really proud of myself for creating the business, if that makes sense. I would love to just see the, our, our team grow because, um, again, getting young, racialized, black, um, indigenous people, disabled people, queer people into positions where they can get six-figure incomes, work 10 months, if that, nine months of the year, and still be healthy and still have lives. Um, getting that to as many people as possible is important to me. It's what I want to do. It's, what I, it's why I want to see us grow also within the next 10 years, um, is opening up offices uh, in Australia, New Zealand, and the US, eventually the US, in whatever way honors the locality of where they are, the indigenous languages to where they are, the realities of where they are. Um, so that every office maybe has a completely different functioning system and policies, um, but that we are able to give resources to and support to beyond what is currently Canada to, to do what we're able to do. I hope to achieve the change of mindset in the arts, um, that it is a very lucrative business. And it's, it's all over the place. Beyonce is an artist. Um, and she's doing really amazing work, film, singing, etc. Now she, she even acted. I, I hope that more people understand that they're watching these people because they're artists. Um, and they're making money from that art. Um, I hope to change that type of ignorant thinking of arts not being a business, arts not being viable, arts not being something that can be last longing. Because art is what you see everywhere. As I said, and I've said it several times, without the arts, we would have been bored during the pandemic because that was what sustained us. The next things for me is, um Honestly, I'm looking to get into some different industries. I'm gonna, I'm about to diversify a little bit now, starting from probably November of next year. So, yeah, I'm gonna diversify into something that's gonna be pretty big. Uh, by the grace of God, I, I, I pray that I'll be able to achieve what I'm gonna do. But that's my next plan. I can't really speak too much on it right now, but it's definitely in the works, and um, uh, it's looking like Calgary is gonna be the spot for it too. Uh, and uh, that's gonna be, that's that, that was my dream business. And that's what is going to be the next move for me. Uh, I mean, it's really going to be, it's a lot different than uh, retail. It's not in retail, but um, now nah, you guys will be around to see the journey, I'm sure. And um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the next goal.